Okay, so I'll start. So I'm presenting this Pakistan and EU trade potential, this report that was published just recently. Well, about an hour ago it was released with FNF, right? So I'll be doing this uh, and Prime Institute. EU is a key export market for Pakistan, right? Agglomer uh, the agglomeration itself is the largest export destination. About now, so it was about $9 billion the exports in 2021. I think it's increased to uh, $12 billion if you look at the imports uh, from, uh, from Pakistan into the EU. So if you look at the import side of the data, we see it's about $12 billion. So the loss in GSP plus, uh, there's this whole this chatter going on. What if we lost the GSP? How much does the GSP actually give us? According to my calculations, and I used the formula, which I'll tell you was from United Nations ESCAP, their study. Uh, so it's about $3 billion, estimated to be $3 billion if we lose the GSP plus status. That's about one third of our trade, right? So this was in 2021. That's the data I used for the calculation. It would have gone up by, uh, because uh, EU expo our exports to EU has expanded in the last two years. Uh, the study focuses on textile, leather, and rice as the other major products exported from Pakistan. So the report basically is the analysis of the trade pattern between the EU and the four trading partners. So we look at India, Bangladesh, and Vietnam. I compare them because India being the largest uh, trading partner in this uh, nearby region. Bangladesh, again, a uh, big competitor, especially in the textile products, and Vietnam is the star or what you can call the rising star of our region in this sense. So this is why I chose these four countries, and this is one of the ones that we usually keep, as, uh, we, we discuss as the most competitive uh, ones that we have in the region. So if we want to look at trade, we look at the ones and the counterparts, how they are performing. So do an analysis, the do an indicators on RCA, reveal comparative advantage, uh, and the unit uh, values, if, uh, look at that, how competitive the exports are. Trade loss, I'll bring some uh, talk about the trade loss, about what the GSP plus, if that's revoked, what does it, what happens. Then we have the presence of NTMs, I call it the lack of it. Uh, Non-tariff measures, how do the regulations on trade, because non-tariff measures look at the product safety and health related issues with the imports of certain goods, and those regulations, how they affect trade. Then I'll talk about some of the firm level challenges and the exports from other non-traditional industries to involve that into our discussion. So the data, trade data, basically is the CPI, is BACI data set. That's basically a, a research think tank, right? CPI in France, which does uh, this BAS, which uses the BACI data, which is basically the, uh, what they do is they agglomerate all these data sets of trade into, uh, into one place, do the calculations. So it's easy to do, calculate using unit value with their data. That's one of the things. So they have one of the problems with Comtrade data is that we don't know whether the goods have been imported in kilos or in tons or in uh, units, et cetera. What BACI data set does is it calculates and calibrates it according to uh, weight wise. So you can do the unit values, you can make it consistent, right? So normalize it. So then we'll look at preference utilization data from European Commission's GSP statistics. That's uh, updated up till 2019. Uh, tariff data, then we have the World Bank World Integrated Trade Solution, which gives us the tariff that uh, United Nations and all the other countries impose on all the goods that they import. Non-tariff measures, UNCTAD's NTM hub, which is the source of NTM hub. ITC also, International Trade Center also collects data, but I use the NTM hub because it's easier for researchers to work on that data that they provide. They provide the researcher raw file, which is the, so they tells us exactly what the NTMs are and who applies them, et cetera, over about 60 to 80 countries that they have. It's about 100 if you include EU with it. So firm level data, World Bank Enterprise Service data, uh, that is something that's for my firm level study that I have on the periphery of this report. And then I got the comments and feedback from Ministry of Commerce, Prime Institute, APMA, and Pakistan Textile, uh, Textile Council. The, when we had started writing this paper, we had a meeting with the four representatives from these four uh, agencies, and then we talked about that for groups or agencies. Eight beneficiaries of GSP Plus in 2019. Pakistan and Philippines were the largest beneficiaries, and both reported more than 50% growth in their trade between 2013 and 2021. So imports from Pakistan into the EU were primarily of textile products, while imports from Philippines were in electrical machinery and equipment. So it's a different, so Philippines has a different uh, export basket compared to ours. We are mostly focused in textile. Sri Lanka, I think, is the other GSP Plus, uh, which has about 50% exports in textile, and the re rest is in fish and seafood. Uh, I think Pakistan has that one thing that is highly focused in textile, right, in, among the GSP plus beneficiaries. And we are the largest beneficiary. So most of Pakistan's imports into EU were eligible for GSP plus preferences. So this is about the concessions. So I think the concessions that are applied, textile receives a lot of concessions, uh, special concessions, because the actual con uh, uh, import tariffs that they put on is about 12%, then the 
MFN countries get that 12 percent, then the GSP countries get about 9.6 percent and then it's decreased to zero for GSP plus countries with EBA and everything but arms and GSP plus are treated similarly in this case. So, Pakistan utilized more than 97 percent of the eligible imports, right? So, basically 97 percent of the, of the products that we import uh, uh, sold to EU had this, uh, received these benefits. Given that Pakistan exports mainly textile products, GSP plus preferences for Pakistan is important as textile products receive preferential tar tariff reductions. So, that same point, Pakistan has benefited even though GSP plus has several conditions attached and there is all this debate about the conditions that the EU imposes on us. So, those compliance of those, how, uh, how, well, how necessary or how important and what kind of issues it creates for us, the challenges it creates for us. But Pakistan, I think, has already complied with the extra um, conventions that EU is going to impose on us. It's going to increase from 27 to 32, right, uh, in the next uh, that they are planning. I think the current one has been extended, as I have heard, was about for four years. And the next one that is pla they're planning to bring in about 32 conventions, five more conventions, right? So that will be there. So this is the trade uh, structure, right? So we total imports Philippines. So EU imported more from Philippines. But the GSP that we used was about three times more. So the, as a GSP beneficiary, our imports were about three times more than, uh, so the ones that the GSP were applied to, right? So eligible is something else, and then we have that those products that could receive uh, the tariff concessions, the ones that we, uh, and the ones that we used, so ones that were applied on. So we basically, uh, uh, yeah, so that's the thing, 97% of our products were covered by GSP. And Philippines, even though it was, uh, the EU imported more from Philippines, uh, we were the largest beneficiary of GSP compared to then it's Sri Lanka, then uh, the third in line, right, or the second in terms of, but sim it's similar, the GSP used with Philippines. So one of the reasons, again, Philippines exports all these electrical machineries and all products, right, which already have a lot of concessions, which already are zero rated, I think, by EU. So it gets a lot of benefits in that sense. So the total imports, if we look at the imports here, Pakistan, the green bar is textiles, and it's highly focused in textiles. Sri Lanka is about 50% textiles. Uh, Philippines, very minimal textile imports into the EU, right? It's all others, mostly electrical machinery and all that. They have diversified away. So there's this whole this debate about Philippines. Uh, is it really benefiting from GSP plus? They can have a debate. For us, yes, we are a beneficiary. We are benefiting quite a bit from GSP plus in that sense. But then there's this whole this debate about internally, because how dependent is it making us on textile exports? That's the question. So if you look at the growth of tar, so the product that actually grew the most in the last 10 years to Europe was rice, which is interestingly, right? So we got a lot of recent concessions with rice. Uh, we have been able to export our rice to the East Asian countries, and we've got that benefit. So Malay with Malaysia, I think our FTA in 2019, when it was redesigned, it included rice in that. And since then, we've also uh, exported uh, to the European countries. So that's one benefit we have. Textile, again, the growth is pretty much high. Uh, then the others, but the other countries, their trade is much more minimal, right? So if you look at Armenia, Armenia graduated from the GSP plus, um, uh, I think last year, and Uzbekistan replaced it. So it's now Bolivia, Cape Verde, Kyrgyzstan, Sri Lanka, Mongolia, Pakistan, and Philippines, right? So these are beneficiaries. Uzbekistan has now included in 2022, I think they started uh, with GSP plus. Armenia graduated from it because it became a middle income country. So that's one change. But their imports to trade with the EU is pretty much, small, much smaller than what ours is and Philippines is. Right? So we have that. So then comes the question is the other four countries that I've looked at, the three countries, which is Vietnam, India, and uh, Bangladesh. So EU imported $22 billion in textile products from Bangladesh and $7 billion from Pakistan. So Pakistan, India, and Vietnam were almost the same in their amounts of trade with uh, EU in terms of textile products. India and I think Vietnam, India in 2021 exported about 50 to 60 billion dollars worth in total products and Vietnam did that roughly the same 48 to 50 billion dollars. But textile was naturally a much more smaller sector in them, uh, in India and uh, Vietnam. So Germany, Italy, Spain, Netherlands, France and Poland are the top markets for all four exporters. So if we rank them in the top five, Poland is interesting, but Bangladesh exports a lot to Poland. Uh, so that's why it comes in. I think it doesn't do that much to Italy. I, I we'll just look into that. But I think Poland is one of the largest in terms of Bangladesh as an importer. The otherwise, Germany, Spain, Netherlands, France all uh, uh, appear as the top uh, destinations for India, uh, India, Pakistan, and Vietnam. 
So, the question comes in, is it our market that we need to diversify uh, within the EU or is it the products that we need to diversify? I say that it's products that we need to diversify because the markets, that's where the demand is. The smaller markets don't have that much demand comparatively because your other larger countries are attracting the, the thing, uh, your trade there. So, market demand is concentrated mainly within these markets. Then Bangladesh dominates trade in textile products. Uh, and then Pakistan shares a similar export bundle to Bangladesh, while India and Vietnam reported different export baskets. So when we look at our trade here pattern here, we see that textile, uh, Bangladesh is the orange line, and Bangladesh has a large uh, share going towards uh, like, uh, important from Bangladesh in textile, right? So we are basically comparatively the same. Vietnam is, I think, smaller. Vietnam is around the five billion dollar mark in textile. Pakistan, and India, almost the same, with about seven billion. And uh, we have then leather, India is the la uh, largest source for leather, followed by Vietnam, interestingly. And then it's Pakistan and Bangladesh. Rice, so we are the largest export in terms of rice, right? So the recently in 2018, 19, I think our rice products started increasing to, uh, uh, to the EU. And then the other ones, uh, well, India and Vietnam are way ahead in them, right, compared to Bangladesh and Pakistan. So if you look at our composition of our exports, and we see that it's pretty much similar with Pakistan and Bangladesh. So a large chunk is textile. Bangladesh, about 90% of it is textile. For us, the green, uh, uh, the green figure, uh, the green area is about 80, 80%. And then India and Vietnam. So look at India. It's petroleum products, pharmaceuticals, and then they have like uh, electric or electronic items, which is like smartphones, etc. Vietnam, on the other hand, is exporting a lot of these mobile phone uh, so these are the countries, and if you look at that, they are basically the same. Uh, Vietnam and so Germany is a, the most important destination for all uh, four countries, right? Followed, then you have that Italy appears for India, Pakistan, and uh, Vietnam in the top five. You have Netherlands, Spain, France, right? So you have these countries here. Uh, for I think uh, Bangladesh, it's Poland instead of Italy, which is in the top five. So Poland is a very important so, uh, destination for Bangladeshi textile item products. But again, because Bangladesh, uh, Poland may have those industries there where there may be uh, there may be a lot of networks going on, right, with the Bangladeshi exporters. And uh, Pakistan's Poland, uh, I think, ranks in the top eight or seven, right, with that 0 0.7 there. So this is the growth that we have. And if you see this here, uh, again, textile it's grown, right. So we have this. So the top uh, textile, I think, uh, if you look at this. Almost all countries have seen positive growth in textile, except for maybe India, I think. India didn't really see a rise in this textile exports in the last 10, 8 years. Uh, it's been moving away from textile, I guess, India. But the other countries, Vietnam, Pakistan, Bangladesh, there's been a large increase, right? So the imports, and Bangladesh is pretty much dominant. One thing more interesting about Bangladesh here is that if you look at the products that uh, they are exporting, so even in the top 15 products, you can see that their top 15 products, that constitutes about $15 billion of the $22 billion in textile. But if you uh, look at Pakistan's top 15 products, Bangladesh still dominates there with more than $10 billion to $11 billion of exports in the products that we export, which is about $4.5 billion. So the top 15 products in textile that we export, right? so that's about $4.5 billion to the EU. But Bangladesh, the, in those same products, ends up exporting a lot more. And its growth in those products has been higher too. So and interestingly, if you look at the last uh, row, right, when you come to the growth in the textile industry, so the top 15 products that we export that should have been our top products in the EU, even all the other countries have grown there in significant way. Vietnam has grown more than us, and uh, India and uh, uh, Pakistan have almost doubled their exports in those products. But uh, if you look at that, India's, uh, well, is pretty much very minimal in that sense, right? So otherwise. So this is the amount of exports coming in those top 15 products. So this is the top 15 products that are being imported from EU and going into the different destinations. So this is product-wise. So Bangladesh, if you look at the Bangladesh's chunk in this top 15 products, that's how much is contributing to different destinations in the EU, right? So Vietnam's top 15, ours is the least in that sense. So our 15 products are not, not as much in terms of exports to the other destinations. So Bangladesh, if you look at the destination wise of these each products, you see how much uh, there is, right? So leather appears in our top 15 products, but again, uh, other countries don't really export as much leather as we do, right? So uh, in those top 15 products that appear in this top 15 products. This is the top 15 products in Pakistan that are being exported, right? And then Bangladesh's top 15 products, India's top 15 products. So leather is not really a product there. The other, even textile doesn't appear in India and Vietnam if you look at these numbers here. 
Uh, this is same in 2013 and in 2021, right? So we have this here. Okay, so into the top five, this just shows the flow chart for how dense our export is compared to the other countries in that sense. How much do we actually contribute comparatively? And if you just look at the top five products, so includes only from Pakistan. So if you look at our products, the ones that we are exporting. So here we see Bangladesh having a pretty big chunk here in its exports, right, to the other countries. India's is, uh, well, India doesn't export a lot of products that we export, that means. Vietnam's is pretty much limited. So Vietnam is not exporting the same goods that we are exporting to the different markets. But Pakistan's top 15 products, so Pakistan's top 15 products is Bangladesh, again, has a large chunk of the market and share in that sense. It's exporting a lot of products that we typically export to the EU. And uh, this is all dominated in textile, right? You see red all over. So in the previous one, it was blue and uh, red, right? In that sense, red was for textile and blue was for uh, the uh, all other industries in the previous graph. Here, it's blue. And that's what you see, right? So in our top 15 products, we have leather and textile mainly, and some rice, I guess, and that's what it is here. So if you look at our exports, there's a lot of uh, competition coming from Bangladesh to our destination. Now let's come to the buying material. So what then I was asked was to do this in a more uh, disaggregated way to look at cotton-based products, synthetic-based products, and the other materials used in the products, uh, production of apparel. No, so these are the 15 products that we export top 15 products of Pakistan. So in that, what it shows is this, that India doesn't trade as much in those products that we typically trade in. So is India really competing with us? So that's the thing. Yeah, so the size is small because that's the only value that India has of the exports that we are sending to the top five markets. So our top five, the products that are going to these top five markets, right? How much of India's is going to the top five markets? That's what's looking into the same products that we export. And in that, look, if you see the, um, the size, Vietnam doesn't really compete with us. So that's what I'm trying to actually show that it's Bangladesh that's competing with us. India and Vietnam don't really compete in those products that we are exporting. Right? So this is actually something that comes up and makes it very interesting, is that when we look at data and we see that, uh, is, are we getting that comp competitiveness, uh, the, the increase in competitiveness or whatever it is, how much does India and Vietnam actually matter for us when we ex export these goods? Right? So that is what this uh, thing is. So it's Bangladesh, a large chunk is in Bangladesh's hand, but smaller, much smaller chunk is in India and Vietnam's hand. Vietnam doesn't even exist there, right? So two thirds of the textile imports from Pakistan were cotton-based value added products, while only 0.7 worth in synth synthetic. So when we do it by material, we see that cotton-based is pretty much there, but synthetic, right? So when you look at synthetic products, Pakistan doesn't really export synthetics, less than 10% of its total textile exports to the EU. Uh, imports of cotton-based products from Bangladesh were more than 16 billion, right? But Bangladesh has diversified. So it's grown from 1.7 billion in 2013 to 4.5 billion. Uh, so that's a big increase. India and Vietnam have typically exported non-cotton-based textile products. And that's where we see that there's a large chunk of non-cotton-based products coming from India and Vietnam. Vietnam does very well in, say, textile, in synthetic products, in uh, exports of synthetic products. So dependency, our dependency on cotton-based products has increased, while the other countries, we're seeing a decline there. Right? So if you look at this, again, you see a large chunk. Yes, synthetic products from Bangladesh has increased. But uh, so that is the thing here. So has cotton-based products. So Bangladesh has increased both. But the share of synthetic products has increased more because it's grown faster. And then the other material that they're using, that's also increased, right? So then you have the all other uh, products, which is the last one, which is basically the non-made uh, uh, up, non-made uh, uh, like up or apparels in that, which is the other chapters, right? So in that, you see India as a large export in that sense to the EU, right, uh, followed by Pakistan. So it's synthetic is dominated by Bangladesh and Vietnam. Other materials, again, there's a lot of dominance by Bangladesh and Vietnam in that sense. Uh, so the growth here, we talk about the growth in the textile materials. Uh, here too, we see that Bangladesh exports more to EU than Pak in the first, Pakistan in the first three categories. Share of synthetic products is increasing in exports from Bangladesh and Vietnam to the EU. So this again question comes up, is if you see uh, Bangladesh's growth in the products that we are exporting, it is pretty much there, right? It's better, it's doing a lot more than us. Uh, well, it's doing pretty well in that sense. And it's uh, the imports from Bangladesh are a lot more than uh, what we are, uh, what your, Europe is importing from us in those products. So you see the growth as well as the factor here. 
But one thing that stands out again is our growth in the cotton-based products that we exceed in Bangladesh. So we focused our textile exports towards cotton-based products. And this is where actually it's very becoming very interesting. We last year we saw a large amount of cotton being imported. We imported, I think, about two billion dollars worth of cotton from the United States in 2022 or 2021. 2021. That's a big amount, right? Given that uh, it's used and the local cotton is getting replaced, right? I think even the former minister Hassan Iqbal talked about this and uh, about us importing a lot more cotton in the last uh, few years. So that actually has an implication on how naturally cotton, how our, because we're not uh, moving towards the synthetic products as much as other countries are. So that's where the challenge is, is in diversification within the industry. So again, there's a straight pattern. This is with the textile material based. Again, Bangladesh dominates it. This is the same thing. And if you see this in Vietnam, you see a lot more, it's a lot more colorful in the sense synthetic. A lot of those synthetic products are being originated from Vietnam into the other countries. Bangladesh too has a lot, a lot of synthetic products. Ours is much more limited. It's more red than anything else. Again, India has a smaller chunk because India exports, again, not that much as uh, Bangladesh does in the same products that Pakistan does. So these are, again, products that are dominated by Pakistan. So this comes to the question of unit value. We compare unit value with reveal comparative advantage. So the unit value is basically calculated as the ratio of total value of imports into the EU divided by the total quantity of imports into the EU from a trading partner. And RCA is the total share, it's a specialization, right? Share of product in the total exports from a trading partner divided by the share of the product in the global trade, right? So the more specialized you are, higher this share. So unit value can be used to determine the level of price discrimination. So the difference in price from another country of your imports, that's what unit value would tell us if we rank unit value. So lower the price, right? In this sense, I rank that higher. So goods cheaper, cheaper goods are ranked higher in this uh, unit value assessment. And then RCA, again, uh, we have the RCA, the real comparative advantage, more specialized you are, higher your rank. So uh, one thing that comes up is that Countries like Vietnam, India will have lower ranks in RCA because they are more diversified in their export base compared to us, uh, Bangladesh and Pakistan, right? So that will be something natural that's going to come into the uh, graphs here. So, low, and another thing is, well, you lower unit value also indicates lower quality of the product. So if the quality can be defined in this sense, so then you're basically saying that if it's a one-to-one -one comparison, you can say that. So Pakistan and Bangladesh report lower unit values and higher levels of RC in textile products, less diversification in that sense. India and Vietnam report predominantly high unit values in value added textile products, also across materials relative to Pakistan and Bangladesh. Bangladeshi producers are more likely to compete against Pakistan textile producers in terms of the unit value or price competition, right? So then we see that. So I'll just go through this. Again, textile, India and Vietnam are exporting higher quality, higher unit value products. While we see in other industries, we are we are, in other industries we do see ourselves being pretty high in that sense. That just shows a lack of competitiveness in number four, which includes other industries, right? So we are not competing well in that sense. In rice, again, we have a high unit value compared to other countries here. So especially against India, right? So, but our RCA is uh, pretty much high. So interesting in number four, one of the reasons our RCA high is high again is because of the lack of diversification in our exports. So in Bangladesh, I think they have a very small share of in other industries, so it, the RC isn't there. But in ours, I think medical instruments and inflatable balls are something that we export quite a bit. And uh, we get, because we are again very specialized towards them, so the RCA is much higher in that sense. That's why ranking of RCA is high. But our unit value tends to be high in those products as well that we export. So whatever this is being exported, so this will give us a bias in that sense that even if you're exporting a few products and you're exporting quite a bit of that compared to the world average, then your RCA will be high, right? I see is biased by these shares, right? So in that sense. Less diversity. Less diversity would be the reason why we have such a high RCA. So that's, if you if I had China here, China would be very low on RCA because it's more diverse with its base. Like our IC, RC, I think highest is around 500 and something. China's would be around six, seven, right? So that's what the ratios are, right? In that sense. Uh, so. Uh, this is the global placement by unit value, and if you see the, the left ones, they are the cheaper goods. The ones on the right, they are the more expensive goods. And then we do the unit value and comparative advantage by material. Again, we are uh, cotton, we are pretty cheap. Synthetic, interestingly, we are again uh, rank low in unit value. 
But this is where the question comes up. This is what I want to bring up in this sense. If you look at all of this, we have low unit value when it comes to textile, even across the products, right? Except for all others, right? The one, two, and three in the made up ones, we are pretty low in value. Is the actually the input ones that we, we don't compete uh, our inputs, the, uh, the ones that are basically raw cotton or whatever those inputs one, the ones in the downstream product in textile, they are higher unit value. But otherwise, in the made up textiles, we are actually have low unit value. So when it comes to this, our textile exports are cheap in that sense. So India and Vietnam are exporting more expensive products. And again, the global placement by unit value according to textile material, again, Bangladesh and Pakistan are more towards the left, Vietnam and India, if you see their bars, more towards the right. So unit value is not really a concern for them as much as quality or other investments in products may be, right? Consumer satisfaction may be more of a thing for Indian and Vietnamese exporters than what we see in our products. So trade loss, now this is the important thing here. Pakistan, basically, uh, I was asked to make this assessment of how much if we lose our GSP plus status, what would be the loss to us? So I derived this calculations using a formula borrowed from the United Nations East cap, right? So loss uh, would have been something around the $3 billion mark. Right, so that is how much we would have lost according to my calculations. Germany, so if we look at Germany itself, uh, imports into Germany from Pakistan would have decreased by $1 billion with heavy losses in textile products. And Bangladesh, interestingly, Bangladesh is set to lose its uh, EB everything but arms status in 2029. Uh, it's an opportunity for Pakistan, right? But unfortunately, it's not really discussed here. We don't discuss uh, among our policy makers what's gonna happen in the next five years. After the next five years, when B uh, Bangladesh uses, loses its everything but arms status, and we, how do we take advantage of that? Yes, that will increase our textile exports, but we also need to diversify otherwise. But these are all questions that we need to ask our policy makers. What are the plans there, right? In the next five years, when we talk about this. Uh, so uh, this is what I looked at, and I saw that uh, when I looked at, so what I did was I basically looked at this thing. What if we got the same tariff profile as India into the EU? So if we lost the GSP plus status, Right? The next best thing would be getting the same tariff profiles as India's, uh, so what India gets on its imports. Right? So India has GSP, so that would be the next step. And if we got GSP status, what would be the tariff profile there? So if you look at textile, India has about, I would say around that 9% mark, 9.6% mark average textile uh, tariff on the textile. Uh, rice, interestingly, Bangladesh, I think, doesn't really export rice as much, or it's just really low in that sense. But uh, or it may be everything but arms, rice, they get concessions. Uh, Pakistan and um, India, I think Pakistan gets about 14% on its tari uh, tariff on rice, and India gets about 19%, if I'm not mistaken. Leather, minimal ta tariffs. Interestingly, B uh, Bangladesh has some tariffs on that, but that could be due to some products. I don't know, why, but according to this calculation, it's minimal, right, in that sense. And even in others, it's minimal. So a lot of concessions are given in the, minimal, in the other industries to both all three countries. Uh, so potential trade loss, it's about $3 billion from a total trade of $9 billion. And if we look at the countries here, we see this distribution here. So, Bangla, uh, so Germany uh, gets the big, uh, loses, uh, well, we lose a lot in Germany, right, the most in that sense, because it's the largest trading partner in EU. Uh, so bed linen, not, uh, these are the products, and if you look at the products, how they are going to uh, th uh, look at, so women's trousers and men's trousers, we have that, that would be the biggest that's the biggest products that we export to EU, and that's the loss we would have if we lose our GSP plus status. Uh, trade loss for Bangladesh after it loses its EBA status, so this is something around, uh, it's estimated around, I think, about 12 billion or something that they would lose out if they lose their everything but arm status. So the green would be the loss. Uh, we, we basically, this is how much, we, how much EU imports from us, the green bar from Pakistan. The loss from Bangladesh is the red one, and the imports from Bangladesh is the... Uh, uh, the blue bar. So the red bar is what we need to capture, right? So how much of that red bar can we capture in the different products? So now we come to the non-tariff measures. So apart from trade policy objectives, countries adopt non-tariff measures, right, to protect the health of the consumers, but also to ensure products imported meet certain safety and standard uh, regulations. So that's one thing. Pakistan reports one of the lowest usage of NTMs on its imports, while other countries also more diverse in the type of uh, NTMs, Pakistan lacks that diversity uh, in those NTMs that it applies. Lack of regulations on imports, that also matter here. So if you look at the non-tariff measures, again, we impose very minimal measures, even with textile material compared to what EU 
and Bangladesh does. So, it is interesting to see here that Bangladesh actually does a lot of requires a lot of labeling on the goods that it imports. I think it is a lot to do it, uh, they revamp their NTMs after the fire incidents. Uh, the, their textile, uh, they wanted to make sure that the regulations now match with those of the EU because EU put a lot of restrictions on their products, etc. So, that is something that we see. So, if you see that Bangladesh is uh, kind of in that sense uh, merging. I have not done the other calculations like the prevalence score and all that which I could have done, but uh, that is again due to lack of space. So, the frequency index and coverage ratio if you look at that, this is pretty much and we lack NTMs. Uh, the purple bar is non-existent in textile and in other products. In rice, we, everyone imposes non-tariff measures in some way or the other. So, if you look at this, we are basically looking at conformity assessment while EU has a more diversified uh, range right, of, uh, of NTMs that they apply on their products. Again, labeling and all, we, uh, fo uh, Bangladesh focuses more on labeling. We do not have any labeling requirements on our products as such, very minimal in the fourth one, the other products. I think it is in food products that we have some labeling. But it is mostly conformity assessment while there is more diversi uh, diversification in the other countries that we see. Uh, okay, so, then I come to the firm level challenges. So, the World Bank Enterprise Service provides firm level data on firm obstacles and female participation. So, I was asked to talk about some of this by uh, Pakistan Textile Council and APMA asked me to put this into my report. So, I did here. Pakistani firms report the highest constraints due to uh, transit and customs related obstacles again. The lowest constraints are reported by Bangladeshi and Vietnamese firms. This could uh, reflect a conducive environment to trade. So, Bangladesh and Vietnam, we have seen that they have a much more better trade conducive environment than Pakistan does. Female participation, we actually struggle a lot in that. So, obstacles faced by firms, if you look at the uh, obstacles that we face, the red bar is the ones with no or minor obstacles, right. So, Vietnam and Bangladesh are pretty much there on, uh, it is pretty much well covered in that sense. A lot of firms, re uh, exporting firms, do not really report that, but our firms they do, right. So, we have that here and there is a lot of obstacles. So, major or severe obstacles are pretty much high in this sense. In uh, Pakistan's case, the green bar is pretty much uh, more relevant to us, right, is the highest. So, if you take the green and the blue sum, that is the highest for us and the lowest is the red, right, and uh, look at if you look at it across the industries. Uh, then uh, in female participation, uh, we are almost non-existent, especially in leather and uh, footwear, we have almost zero participation of female workers, production workers. Textile, we have some, about 10 percent. Bangladesh does a lot better than India in its uh, female participation rate. And Vietnam is more than 60 percent of the uh, production workers are female in a lot of their firms on average, which is pretty high in their sense, right. Uh, in textile, then in uh, uh, all other industries, it is low. So, uh, then I look at the potential products in other industries, right. We have these other undenatured ethyl alcohol, medical instruments, inflatable balls and footwear. So, what we come in, so we have a clear advantage in undenatured ethyl alcohol, medical instruments and um, inflatable balls, India and Bangladesh are able to export at a cheaper rate. Uh, about 1 billion was imported uh, by the EU from Vietnam in footwear, right. So, Vietnam is a large export of this footwear products that we uh, export. And that is something that I have seen. So, these are the top four products that we export to the EU. So, price advantage. So, this is a question. Is price advantage likely driving uh, trade here? That is always a question that we should ask. And we see that Vietnam actually uh, sells it at a higher rate, right, than uh, we do. So, when we look at footwear trade, we see that there is a large growth, especially coming in from uh, Vietnam in that. So, growth is not there for Vietnam, but uh, they have a large import, like their imports are pretty high in that sense. From Vietnam is pretty high when it comes to footwear. Uh, it is followed by India and then uh, Pakistan is pretty much minimal in this. So, the largest industry is undenatured ethyl alcohol, right, which is again linked to the sugar industry. Uh, uh, Prime has done some work on sugar industry, so they can talk about that. But uh, then we have medical instruments and we are getting a lot of competition from Vietnam in that sense. And then if you look at again the trade flows, uh, the CA trade flows. Right, so we have this. So the, the, the next one is recommendations. So we have this trade flows here, right? So again, a lot of domination from Vietnam in footwear compared to the other products that we have. So these are same products. Bangladesh is almost non-existent in these uh, products. In the other products, it's mostly focused on textile, right? Bangladesh, but you have Pakistan there, and then you have India, and then Vietnam has a large chunk in this total trade. Uh, so. Recommendations avoid uh, revocation of GSP plus status. That is something that we need to really look at because it will really have issues with our balance of payment uh, related challenges. Uh, we need to focus on product diversification. Product really needs to, ex uh, Pakistan really needs to export more products and upgrade the quality of products. 
satisfy the needs of consumers in export markets. It's important to understand the consumer behavior in the European markets and produce according to the needs of the consumers rather than uh, look at what producers are getting, right? The, the, the give out, the handouts that we give to producers, we should focus on what the consumers need. Improve the regulatory environment. Again, there's a lot of debate on this on the quality of food that we export. There's, uh, uh, we just got this news that Gulf countries are not importing anymore from Pakistan because of the substandard food, that meat that we are selling to them. So that's always there. We, are, we need to look at better trade facilitation, Pakistan single window and national compliance center. The roles need to be enhanced further. Female labor participation, that is something that I looked at, right? So again, we need to increase because there are benefits to this, uh, the economic benefits, right, to this. And then exports from non-traditional industries promote the role of SMEs. It's important to get SMEs into uh, international trading activities. We need to focus on the SMEs and increase the role of SMEs. We don't see that in Pakistan as much as we see in Vietnam or Bangladesh, right? Uh, so that the key products need to be identified and look at them. So the medical instrument, the SME sector, make their cost lower. How can we make them more efficient? Right? That's the thing, the CR code-based industries that are doing very well. With this, I think it's, uh, I conclude my... Uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you.